Thank you. And uh, just a heads up that the meeting is being recorded. We'll post a, a link to the recording on the meeting website kind of shortly, shortly after the meeting. Um, if you go to the meeting website, uh, the slides are available now if you wanted to click through. Uh, also, just a reminder that we have uh, nurse user Slack. So let's uh, just paste the address to that in the invite to that in the chat in case you're uh, not already on. It's a, a good place to continue the conversation. In fact, it's probably a, a, a better place for uh, typing chat than using the Zoom chat because uh, the, you know, the Slack chat will uh, yeah, remain visible after the meeting and we can continue the conversation afterwards. Uh, and there's a, a hashtag webinars channel in Slack, which is a good place for discussion here. So today's plan will follow the same format as we've been following in these meetings. So it's uh, intended to be quite interactive. Please participate, wave a hand or just speak up. You should be able to unmute yourself uh, at any time. Um, yeah, also, you know, uh, feel free to comment in the uh, webinars channel in the NERSC Slack, uh, yeah, particularly if your environment isn't conducive to, to speaking aloud. So our agenda will follow our, our typical agenda, which is we'll start out with a, a session for the yeah, win of the month and, a, and today I learned. Uh, we'll have a few announcements and calls for participation and also an opportunity for people here to announce and uh, uh, other things that you know about that might be interesting to nurse users. Uh, and then we'll spend a while on our topic of the day, which we're going to talk today about GPU programming models and interoperability. Uh, and we'll finish up with uh, a of a heads up for what's coming up and a quick run through our last month's numbers. Okay, so first section is win of the month and the aim of this um, component of the meeting is to show off an achievement or shout out somebody else's achievement. So uh, it can be it can be something small, it can be something big. You might have had a paper accepted, you might have solved a bug that had been giving you grief for a little while or, or that had you know, something particularly interesting or challenging about it, um, you know, especially if it's something that can be a good tip for, uh, for other nurse users. Um, you know, maybe you, you achieved a, a, a major scientific achievement uh, or something that would be a good candidate for a nurse science highlight or a high impact scientific achievement award or an innovative use of high performance computing award. So if you've uh, used nurse facilities in a way that yeah, is a bit different to the traditional usage of HPC and you know, exposes new capabilities. Yeah, we're, we're very interested in, in how our users are yeah, innovatively uh, making use of the resources available. Uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to share to kick us off? Lots of uh, silence around the room. Just for my own sanity, uh, the audio was working, right? Somebody, somebody give a wave to indicate. Yeah, it's working. Cool. So I guess on our side in the, in the last month, NERSC's exciting news was we held the, the Perlmutter dedication, which is sort of an important uh, step towards Perlmutter becoming available for uh, users. We're, we're still in the process of the, uh, yeah, getting, it, getting the environment ready uh, for early access users. 
to come on, but uh, that should happen yeah, hopefully soon. I think, uh, I think Paul sent an email around uh, just the other day gathering uh, uh, applications. All right, maybe we'll jump across to the other side of the coin, which is the today I learned. And this is an uh, opportunity to, uh, to share experiences with something something you knew or interesting or surprising that you know might uh, might be beneficial also for other users to hear about and this can be something that didn't work you know we we do researchy sort of you know often cutting edge stuff and that does always carry a risk that you know we we try something and it turns out that it doesn't work and it's sort of an important um element of the science, discovering what doesn't work as well as what does and, and learning from that. Um, as well as that, though, it can be just uh, something interesting that you came across, like a, you know, an interesting webinar that you saw or a, uh, a tip or a highlight that you saw from somewhere. I think I saw something in Slack about the direct note access for Cori login notes with the dash 224 thing. Ah, yes. Uh, there is a, a what do you call it, a, a less public um, address for each login node. Although in most cases, if you need to get to a specific login node, probably the easiest way to do it is to, to, you know, to log in as normal. And then from the login node, you can also just SSH Corio 4, for instance. Uh, that can be useful if you're, for instance, running screen in the background. Was there, William, was there a, a particular use case that you had where the, the 224 address? Yes, screen would be a good use of it, I think. Yeah, so for that, you don't, you don't actually need to remember the different address, so long as you can remember the um, which login node you are running on. So if you're like me and tend to forget that sort of thing, putting a, a little readme note or a you know screen.txt in, in your home directory with uh, yeah, with which node you're running on can be a, a helpful thing as well. Because that's uh, yeah, shared across all of the nodes. Uh, we've got a comment. My audio might be breaking up a little. That uh, is possible, unfortunately. The limitations of uh, telework and uh, internet. So something that I discovered in the last month that uh, uh, was somewhere between a today I learned and a, oh that was a, a bit of a win was using Shifter to do things that are easy in Ubuntu, but not necessarily easy on a system like Cori. Uh, this particular uh, example was there was a, a question about running uh, LaTeX. And you know, typically that's something that you would do on, on a, a home system, but yeah, there, there are certain use cases where it's, it's handy to be able to run it on Cori. But, it has a lot of dependencies and it's ever it's pretty sort of a complex thing. Uh, it turns out that there's a Docker image for LaTeX for, of a tech live. And uh, with a, a simple shifter image pull on that Docker image and then shifter dash dash image, what that image is, yeah, you can use that, run the LaTeX command inside of it. Uh, so that, that seems to me to be a, a, a pretty nifty way of getting some uh, you know, commodity oriented software fairly easily available on, on Tori. I see there's a couple of notes in the, in the chat. I think, oh, uh, let's see. Oh, a little bit more about using screens. So there's some tips from uh, Robert and William about uh, how, to, how to find your screen session. And uh, oh, that's, a, that's a fairly neat uh, script, William. That might be a good one to 
actually pasted a clip into the um, the nurse Slack because it's one that people can put in their uh, yeah and to enter their profile as a quick way to find the screen. I'll try to capture that by the end of the meeting. Any more today I learns before we move on? All right, announcements and uh, calls for participation. So we have a, a few and the details of these can be found in the um, weekly email from this week. Uh, some of them I think may also have individual emails sent around. One kind of important one coming up, it's still, it's still a few weeks away, but there will be a power outage at NERSC on the weekend of July 9 through 12. And it's uh, essentially it's a, you know, a triannual. Every every few years, uh, we need to do some maintenance on the on the power system server at, at OBL. And this particular maintenance this year or in, in July uh, will impact the building that uh, that hosts NERSC and holds things like Cori and a, you know, a lot of NERSC systems. So we're anticipating that our uh, backup power and cooling should be able to keep most of the auxiliary systems running, um, but Cori will be down during that weekend and we'll piggyback Cori's regular uh, maintenance on top of that. So the, the maintenance for July will be shifted to kind of you know, happen uh, in tandem with that power outage. So uh, you can check the weekly email for details. There'll also be announcements closer to the date uh, as we know more what the weather's doing because our ability to keep external or we call it the auxiliary systems up is a, a little bit dependent on how well the, the weather cooperates with our cooling systems. So uh, just a heads up that, to, to be aware of that. Another important heads up is that we will in the next few months, and I think uh, August is the target, need to update Corey's operating system. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a medium scale update. Um, we anticipate that executables that are statically linked will need to be relinked for you know, newer correct versions of static libraries. Stuff that's dynamically linked should just work. So yeah, at most we're preparing for that as well. Um, some calls for participation. There's a parallel applications workshop on alternatives to MPI uh, that will happen at SC21 and also SuperCheck, which is a checkpoint restart workshop. Uh, it will also happen at SC21. And in the weekly email, there's some links to more information about that. Um, does anybody else have any CFPs that they'd like to announce at the moment? It's not strictly a regular CFP, but NERSC just threw out its survey for GPU access for Perlmutter. So if you're interested in getting on in one of the waves to get on the Perlmutter, check your email for the NERSC user uh, survey and fill it out with your code team. Yes, that is a, that is a good tip. So, and I think in that email that mentioned that, uh, so if you're already part of a NESAP project, that's, that's kind of already, Worked out. This is the email. Maybe, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin. Um, uh, is requesting uh, applications for early access to Perlmutter outside of um, you know NESAP and I think maybe ECP. So, yeah, if you yes. think your code is close to ready, NESAP, ECP, and um, super facility projects are already on the on the list. They're already checked off. So, if you're one of those groups, you don't have to fill that out. If you're any other group, fill it out. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So yeah, look out for that. Um, we've got a few training events coming up. Oh, actually, was there any other uh, announcements that somebody wanted to make? I think I saw somebody on Hi, Steve. It's Rob Ryan. I just wanted to Hello. ask you, hi, regarding the parallel applications workshop alternatives to MPI plus X, do you know, do people ever discuss Coray Fortran at at these workshops, it's it's an alternative to MPI plus X. I'm just curious because yeah. I tried it for the first time and I found it kind of quite useful. So 
I don't think I've actually been to the um, poor ATM workshop in the past. So I haven't scanned through the list, but that does sound like you know, within within scope. Because it's uh, yeah, it's it's parallel, it's um Coary Fortran, I think, is part of the Fortran standard now. It's it's reasonably well supported, or well, somewhat, somewhat supported at least. Um, so yeah, I, I would anticipate that the answer is yes. In uh, my but, experience, yeah. it's it's definitely possible. It really depends on what the topics are that year. So if there's a heavy thing, say on, you know, uh, GPUs, then they might not talk much about Fortran. So you might want to uh, look at the um, a little bit more detail on what that workshop is doing this year and what their plan is. It's definitely in the purview, but it's hit or miss as to whether uh, core arrays come up. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. So this is Cheyenne from PNNL. So I have, I usually attend this workshop and uh, there is always discussion on Quarry Fortran because uh, 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 Damien Rousen usually uh, attends it. And, uh, and I remember a couple of years back, there was a very lively discussion on Quarry Fortran saying that, you know, uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, there is always some discussion on CAF and uh, there are CAF people who usually attend, I think. And as you know, Damien Rousen is, I guess, he has recently joined uh, LBL, I guess. Uh, so uh, I think there would be participation. So, yeah. Oh, great. Another workshop to add to my list for SC. Okay. All right. Here we go. Thanks. Yeah, this is great. There's always lots of uh, interesting things on it. So it's, it's quite the competition for attention there. Um, so we have a few training events coming up as well. Um, uh, next week on, uh, on June 22, we'll have a session on LMOD for Perlmutter. So you may have used LMOD before on a different system. It's kind of the follow on from the environment modules, which is TCL based that we use on Cori. Uh, and so on Perlmutter, we're going to shift to using LMOD. And for the most part, it's, it's the same. It's the same user experience. You type module load, you get a module, you type module avail, module unload. Uh, but there's a few little differences in how it works that are useful to know about. Uh, and also a few extra capabilities that are, that are quite helpful. So we'll have a, a training session on that next week. Uh, also, in a couple of weeks' time, we have a training session scheduled for CI at NERSC. So, if you're using something like uh, you know uh, GitLab CI or you know Jenkins or other things like that, uh, and you would like to use that type of a workflow at NERSC, we'll have uh, some tips about that coming up. Uh, there's a ECP Ideas webinar also coming up in a couple of weeks' time. This this can be really interesting for uh, you know picking up tips and tricks about uh, yeah, kind of uh, achieving things in software and scientific software development. Uh, there's also a uh, CUDA multi-threading with streams workshop hosted by or, or presented by NVIDIA coming up fairly soon. Before we go on to our topic of the day, was there any other announcements that we should hear about? So this is Cheyenne from PNNL again. I just wanted to point out that SIAM annual meeting is next uh, month and mm -hmm. the early registration deadline is July 5th. And there are some, um, there are some mini symposia uh, on um, parallel programming models, uh, specifically one that I'm um, arranging with my um, with another guy at PNNL is on PGAS API and languages. Uh, so uh, folks who are planning to attend, uh, uh, please uh, try to find the practical and efficient partition global address space support for data intensive applications, mini symposia. Thank you. That sounds good. Um, do you think you could paste a link into either the, the chat or the Slack chat I uh, shall. Yeah. to where Thanks. people can find out more and register? Right. That's the I, I, same, I, I'm sure. Thanks, Sam. All right, so our topic of the day 
is uh, GPU programming models and interoperability. So this is kind of a, a fairly broad topic. So we have a, a few kind of tips and overview here. And we have a few people online from NERSC. Uh, let's see, we should have, I think, uh, uh, Ronnie, who's part of our uh, application performance group. And I think, Chris is also on, who's part of our advanced technologies group. Uh, and they have a, you know, a good bit of uh, experience with, uh, with some of the different GPU models. I think there's a couple of other nurse people as well. And we're very interested in the input and experiences from you know, the other, you know, other nurse users in the, in the room here. So we'll go through a, a quick overview here and then we'll go into a, a discussion section. Um, so right up front, between different programs, interoperability tends to be sort of limited and difficult. Uh, and, and this is not just for GPUs, this is for everything. So if you're using a C library, you know, calling a C library or working in C, things are kind of relatively easy. C has a, a pretty universal ABI and so your C libraries tend to be able to be used you know, from, from any compiler you know, and, and any programming environment. Uh, yeah, Fortran, for instance, uses special name mangling rules and, and there are, uh, you know, there's a standard bind C to map for, you know, for a given Fortran implementation, the correct binding to, to get between uh, C routines and Fortran routines and you know, C++ talks to C fairly natively. So calling stuff that's in C is reasonably easy. Beyond that though, going across programs tends not to be straightforward. Um, both C++ and Fortran use a particular uh, ABIs and name mangling rules that are implementation specific. So code, uh, C++ code compiled with one compiler or programming environment probably can't talk to C++ code compiled with a different one. So just as a, as a general rule for the, you know, these higher level languages, sticking to one programming environment is generally the best advice. So with that in mind, which programming environment to use, and we're recommending and setting as a default on Kolmata, the program NVIDIA for GPU applications. And this is because it yeah, will have NVIDIA GPUs and NVIDIA's compiler suite and the, you know, the, the program, programming environment around it is kind of the most GPU oriented and GPU friendly. You know, a, a fair bit of work has gone in both from NVIDIA's side as well as Cray's side, uh, HPE, to you know, make sure that this programming environment you know, works pretty smoothly generally. Uh, and it's actually got the best support for interoperability as well of uh, the different programming environments. There are a couple of uh, yeah, caveats to that. Um, admittedly, uh, it sounds like I'm having uh, audio drops. What I might do is stop my video in the hope that it uh, frees up a little bit more bandwidth. Uh, so, of course, the uh, caveat then is that you're using the same programming environment for CPU as well as GPU code. And the NVIDIA programming environment is, is quite GPU oriented. Uh, so your code will need for you know, the, the CPU code as well, will also need to be able to be built with the NVIDIA stack. And you know, it is possible that uh, other compiler suites you know, might give better performance for the CPU code. We sort of anticipate, you know, particularly in phase one of Perlmutter, which is very, very GPU oriented, that uh, the GPU code will be doing the, you know, the bulk of the heavy lifting in terms of the computational work. So, so for most cases, we expect that programming video will be the one to use. Uh, and another tip is, as much as, there is some support for interoperability between different programming models. It tends not to be easy. And so 
yeah, in general, if you can avoid mixing GPU programming models, uh, you know, things will go sm more smoothly. Um, using higher level models can help because you know it's, it's easier, for instance, to use your know, Cocos to call a, a CUDA library than uh, you know, mixing OpenMP and OpenACC together. So this is a, a fairly complex uh, illustration, but it's kind of an overview uh, in the case of uh, programming NVIDIA. So when you, when you module load the program, you kind of get everything built in. So you've, you've got CUDA support, you've got uh, standard Fortran, which has got things like you know, do concurrent and Coary Fortran. Uh, you've also got OpenACC and OpenMP support you know, that extends to GPU, off, GPU offload, as well as the more you know, traditional OpenMP for multi-threading. So OpenMP and OpenACC include a degree of support for, um, for interoperability. Uh, so for instance, there are uh, fragments for OpenMP and OpenACC that allow you to kind of, you know, map data to, to something that's in the GPU memory with CUDA. Um, Cray Impitch also has a degree of uh, GPU support, which uh, really comes down to being able to send things from a GPU you know, a buffer that's in GPU memory rather than in um, uh, what do you call it, RAM, the yeah, regular uh, CPU RAM. And so from these different models uh, in the NVIDIA programming environment, you get access to, you know, to all of the normal things that you're familiar with. So Cray and Pitch, uh, libraries like FFTW and HDF5, uh, but also the CUDA math libraries, you know, so you know, Kubla, less than QFFT. Uh, just a, a tip though, there's this NVLA math library that gives you things like uh, kubeless and so on, but with the more typical BLAS interface, it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, so for an example, this is a, a little snippet of a, a mini app called Games, which is a OpenMP, uses OpenMP task offloading, uh, OpenMP offloading. Uh, but it can call CUDA libs underneath and it uses this uh, use device pointer to define you know, things that are in the GPU's memory and then makes the calls with those. So using other programming environments is likely to be a little bit more complicated. So uh, program GNU, GNU compiler suite has some GPU support. It's a, it's a little patchy. The performance is generally not as good. Um, the Cray programming environment has uh, quite good CPU performance generally. Uh, an interesting, you know, relatively new development is that Cray and HPE are moving towards using uh, a LLVM claim based backend for at least the C and C compilers. Uh, they found that the uh, claim based or the uh, LLVM based Fortran compilers aren't sort of quite there yet for for yeah, their purposes. So that means we've sort of got a split within the programming environment. The C and C++ perform, um, compilers are based on LLVM, whereas the Fortran compiler is developed completely in-house. For both of these, for uh, GNU and for Cray, and generally for you know, everything that's not NVIDIA, uh, CUDA is not built into the environment. So there'll be a separate module load CUDA toolkit that you'll need to do to get access to the CUDA libraries. And so, you know, the image looks a little bit similar, but a little bit different. So you've got, you know, an extra step here for GNU to get uh, CUDA and you've still got access to kind of the same things. And again, you've still got your higher level libraries like Kokos and Raja, which can compile down to these things. Cray, Similar again with a you know, slight extra complexity that your uh, Fortran and C, C++ sides are, are sort of split out. And I think at the moment, uh, Cray is only officially supporting OpenACC from Fortran. Uh, I don't think they've announced uh, a, you know, any, any commitment to support uh, of OpenACC for the um, C and C++ stack. 
So if your code uses uh, OpenACC and C and C++, this is probably not the programming environment that you need. All right, so as a, as a summary, interoperability is possible, but we don't recommend relying on it uh, as, you know, as, as much as you can, uh, keeping within one programming model is, is generally a good tip. Uh, and the, the higher level frameworks are worth looking into, yeah, particularly if, you know, if your code is C++ or you're doing you know, new development, uh, take a look at things like Cocos and Raja. They can give you more flexibility and, and yeah, they aim at uh, performance portability as well. So both OpenMP and OpenACC have support for interoperability, um, especially OpenMP 5.x, I think has, has explicit support for interoperability, but how well that's supported by the compilers is still, is still kind of in progress. Uh, there are a few tips. There's, there's been some uh, training sessions that NERSC has hosted over the last year or so that uh, go into more detail about these. And so if you uh, grab the slides from the meeting website, uh, you can just sort of click through these and you find the, the detail in the, a little bit more easily. So that's kind of overview of the landscape. And for the next kind of 10 minutes, uh, we might open the floor to discussion. Actually, before doing that, I see there's a, a bit of discussion is, is happening in the chat here. Um, I guess there's some questions about uh, Palmetto specifically. Okay, so we might um, bring these up in the Q&A, but just before going to Q&A, either Chris or Ronnie, do you want to uh, say something as a, or say anything in terms of general comments? Um, I think you gave a good overview, Steve. Um, I think our general advice is, um, I mean, do not unnecessarily mix these programming models. Try to stick with one programming model. Um, I mean, that's gonna give you the maximum portability to different DOE systems. Um, so I mean, here at NERSC, we're, we're big advocates for things like OpenMP target offload, which will be portable across all DOE machines. Um, yeah, and if you have particular use interoperability use cases that are important to you, I mean, please let us know um, and then we can actually speak with the vendors directly to ensure that they are supported. Um, because yeah, there's in a way there's like a million different interoperability use cases you could imagine. Um, so it's very helpful for us to prioritize things. That's all I have. Yeah, I think just one other thing, I guess. Um, yeah, so the optimal use cases, well, uh, the most performant use case you would see it if you're sticking to one programming model, uh, one programming environment, uh, which is, I think, what Chris was uh, alluding to as well. So unless you need to, do not like mix things. Um, we will have, we might end up having different CUDA versions that are more latest than what's in, let's say, the program environment in NVIDIA that what um, Steve uh, showed before. So if you want to do that, yeah, sure, go ahead. And it would still work. There won't be any problems there. Um, but there can be some performance hits. Um, but if you feel like there is a use case, please let us know. And that's how we'll be able to uh, alleviate some of that. Um, I can take two of the things that question that I think came up as well and might be related. Um, whether it is uh, CUDA or MPI, yes, it's all CUDA or MPI. We'll have Cray Pitch and UCX um, on the system that you can use um, for MPI. There won't be, I believe, there won't be any open MPI on the system. Uh, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. So, so the, the native MPI for the system will be Cray and Pitch. Right. Um, there's nothing fundamentally stopping somebody from building OpenMPI. Um, and 
it will be able to use the Crane network via the um, uh, open, uh, OFI interface, uh, open, open, fabrics, open Fabric interface. Um, I don't yeah, but we will know not that it will be you know, built in and provided. Right, yeah, we will not have an open MPI build, but you'll, you're more than welcome to have your own uh, open MPI build on the system. Um, did not quite understand the question where the problem are having HIP. Uh, HIP is mostly used on the for the GPU side of things for AMD. Um, considering we will not have a AMD GPU, was the question more like you want to use Perlmutter for a testing bed for other systems? I'd like now, to add on that question. The HIP is able to run on NVIDIA hardware as well. So that's it's correct. Available. Yeah, right. But I mean, the only incentive for us to have that would be if we envision us uh, adding AMD GPUs on the system, right? Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, you know, five or 10 years down the line, uh, will CUDA still be around or will we have gone towards the language that's more interoperable on more hardware? So uh, there might be something to be said for looking at HIP. Obviously, you never know which one to bet on and what's going to happen. But uh, since HIP does work on more hardware, it's a more general thing. Just if you're writing code that you might that might evolve and be used somewhere else. So that, that, that's a, I think that's a fair point, but at the same time, I think it is also uh, like HIP is currently developed by AMD. So like there are performance implications of it when even if you're using HIP to run it on an NV, NVIDIA GPU, um, which is what like, like old CF is doing, right? You can, you can run that on Summit and you can run it on Frontier as well. Um, but, I, but I agree that having that option would be uh, something nice, uh, but I don't believe at this point there will be a HIP module on uh, uh, Parameter to start with. So if I, if I understand correctly, HIP um, comes in the form of uh, essentially a template library that can be... Yeah, yeah it uh, should... It, LinkedIn I mean, it is should the wrong be. word, but... Yeah, it yeah. shouldn't be too painful to just download it and run it yourself the same way you were saying for OpenMPI. Correct, yes. Yeah, I think it would have to be managed by NERSC. I just had a look at the statement of work and there's nothing about HIP in the statement of work. Right. So yeah, we would have to manage that by NERSC staff. Um, so I guess NERSC users, if there's a lot of NERSC users that want it, I mean, please make a request and then we can prioritize what to install. I think yeah, it will I'll, only be important for uh, ECP teams once uh, they get access to Frontier because Frontier uses HIP. Yeah, in, in, in a way, I guess uh, HIP and CUDA are both fairly low level programming models. So, so there's sort of a, a lot to be said for using higher level ones. You know, if, you're, if you're starting a, a new project and deciding whether to use HIP or CUDA, maybe it's worth considering using neither and using perhaps uh, OpenMP target offloading or Cocos or Raja. So regarding inter interoperability, it seemed from the last NVIDIA presentation, uh, it's okay to come uh, mix OpenMP offload with CUDA in certain cases, is that is that a correct assumption? Yes, that is. Um, yeah, the CUDA runtime and the NVIDIA OpenMP runtime are completely interoperable. So you could, for example, um, allocate data using CUDA runtime API functions and then use that data in your OpenMP target offload regions. Um, yeah, it, it works. Do you have any particular no, I don't. I just um, so, for instance, inside um, I think there was a slide on using CUDA inside the device region. I don't know the status of that or what um, they are planning. Um, I think that is possible, at least for Open ACC. Yes, uh, you can use a device pointer uh, either in parallel kernels or data uh, statements. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so 
I'm, I'm not sure what level of flexibility the NVIDIA compiler offers. I think for the Cray compiler, there is a, a caveat that uh, yeah, open, uh, OpenMP target offload and OpenACC target offload can play together to a, to a certain degree. Uh, and I think it is related to, you know, being able to um, sort of, yeah, interoperate about the, uh, what's, the, what's the word for it? Sort of, you know, the, the use device pointer uh, data management, but not necessarily for the, um, you know, compute, what do you call it? You know, scheduling and, and offloading. So, you know, so a, a degree is possible, um, but not, complete, whereas it, it sounds like NVIDIA might have a, a little bit deeper support for that. Um, yeah, I think, are you kind of alluding to kind of source file, a single source file interoperability, Steve? Um, oh, uh, because yeah, that is kind of the enhanced interop that NVIDIA would provide in that you could have a single source file with both CUDA and your OpenMP directives. I mean, that may not be provided by other compilers, which would only offer runtime interoperability. So you'd need to compile the source files into separate object files. Yeah, uh, I don't recall off the, off the top of my head whether the, the caveat with the, um, with the Cray compiler was, was for single source file or for you know, even across source files, but it was about the, the data location rather than mixing the, you know, OpenMP and ACC directives for actually doing the offloading. We're going to yeah. turn the kernel into a... Um, so yeah, I guess the, 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 the summary version is interoperability might be possible, but it's not trivial. So yeah, avoiding it where you can. Is, uh, is worthwhile. Yeah, so I think I that's saw... a fair summary. Yeah, there are some legitimate use cases. I mean, you may want to use exactly in, like this code fragment shows, you may want to use an optimized math library. Um, but yeah, I try to minimize the interrupt requirements um, for your application. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the Zoom chat, I see William posted a um, a link to an NVIDIA article about uh, OpenACC interoperability techniques. And uh, I think I saw that one as well. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll second that recommendation as a, you know, an interesting and, and helpful overview of uh, how things play together and, and how to do it if needed. I'm curious, have um, any of our users online uh, had any experiences, I guess, either on Cori GPU or other systems of codes where they need to mix different programming models? Or maybe it's still in the stage of uh, thinking about how to how to develop the next code. Uh, comment from from Robert about mixing uh, MPI and CUDA. Yeah, that that should be uh, yeah somewhat more straightforward in that the the programming models are, are you know, a little bit more orthogonal. I guess the big catch to watch out for is that the MPI implementation is able to recognize when, for instance, a buffer is in GPU memory instead of in CPU memory. So yeah, that sounds like the most common use case is uh, CUDA plus a different model. This is <clears throat> this is Eric Stern. Yep. Um, 
So uh, we use Cocos and uh, also on a machine that has multiple GPUs, I think uh, we have to use MPI to mix, uh, to, to you know, reduce the results from the different GPUs. And uh, that gets tricky and some machines have MPI configured to make it easy. And some machines, uh, I don't think we've actually been able to get it to work. So, so that's interesting. What are the characteristics that you've noticed between the machines where it's easy and the machines where it's not? Are there, are there some tips that NERSC should be looking out for in our configuration that will make it easier? Uh, well, one of the things I'm hoping to find out is that you've done it correctly. Uh, so the machine that, well, the machine which eventually worked was a, um, was actually a node uh, of a power PC with uh, four, uh, four GPUs reminiscent of uh, one of the OLCF machines. And it was, it was configuring MPI and, and I wasn't responsible for doing this, uh, but we had to have that, the people working on that machine had to do something to make it eventually work. And then on a different machine, which was an Intel machine with multiple uh, GPUs, uh, the people who were different people uh, were not as responsive and they were, they didn't, they didn't uh, make it work in the end. So I guess I don't have a good tip for, for a mm -hmm. nurse, except uh, I'm hoping you guys are better than uh, the people we had. <laughs> Just that it's uh, possible to do. So yeah, uh, I don't remember if we have any kind of you know ready ready tests for that, but it's, it's definitely one to uh, keep in mind. So we're getting we're getting close to the top of the hour, um, and it sounds like the the rate of questions and comments is slowing down. Does anybody have any final? Uh, questions, comments, or tips before we move on to our next section? And if not, thanks again, uh, Chris, Ronnie, and everybody else who participated. There's uh, a lot of interesting yeah, content and, and learning there. So. Flipping back through to our last couple of sessions. Uh, coming up, we're always looking for topic requests, topic suggestions, even better, if you'd like to show off your work. Um, this is a good uh, forum for it. You know, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minute slot, time for some Q&A, time for a, you know, a quick overview of what you're using NERSC for and tips and tricks that you've learned or you know gotchas that might help or you know simply interest other nurse users uh, it might also be an opportunity to um you know, make contact with people in quite different science areas who it turns out are uh, doing similar things computationally to what you're doing so if you would like to um you know to participate in this way to to give a bit of a, a lightning talk and tell us about what you're doing uh, we're very interested to hear. You can uh, post something in webinars or, uh, or send me a DM or an email if you like, and you know, we can set something up at a, you know, choose a, a meeting that's convenient for you. Other than that. So our final um, section is a quick look over last month's numbers. So for May, we had uh, yeah, generally generally pretty high availability. We did have a couple of unscheduled outages to, you know, in one case, to a you know, essentially a hardware issue with the power supply and uh, another brief outage while uh, due to some luster issues and the user experience was uh, scratch hanging. 
we had a normal scheduled maintenance. Other than that, things kind of ran reasonably smoothly for me. Our uh, utilization has continued to sit uh, you know, pleasantly high, up around 90, 94%. And we have a, a large job metrics, large jobs metric where you know, we would like to see 25% or more of the system usage being for you know, being spent on things that really can't be done elsewhere. So we tell you really large scale stuff. And we've seen that quite high actually for, for quite a while now on Quarry. So it's been sitting up over, over 30% for I think at least the last year. Our ticket uh, incoming and outgoing rate seems to be sitting reasonably steady. They're going out at about the, the same rate that they're coming in. We have a current backlog of uh, a little over, well, somewhat, somewhat over 400 tickets. So that's our uh, current state and all that we have for today's meeting. Thank you all for joining. Um, continue the chat in the webinars channel. I'll capture the chat on Zoom and uh, paste a few of the links that people posted there. I think there's some, some good tips and the recording should arrive uh, and have a, a link to it from the um, from the meeting website fairly soon. Thank you all, and 